Good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on when you're, where you're logged in from, depending on your time zone. We are very happy to uh, see, have a great response to this webinar with close to a thousand participants um, registered thus far, mostly from across Canada, but also international locations, including the US, Indonesia, India, and the UK. So welcome. My name is Sean Secord. I am the program advisor of the Northern team for the uh, implementation support and knowledge mobilization team at Cadith, And I have the privilege of being the moderator for today's session. I am located in Whitehorse, Yukon on the traditional territories of the Kwan and Dun First Nations and the Tahan Quichan Council. I've had the privilege of living in the Yukon for the last 20 years, learning a great deal from, from the First Nations culture, uh, from the First Nations themselves. So I, I do encourage everybody to reflect upon whose traditional land you reside on uh, what they've contributed and how you can learn from them. This is the fourth presentation in a series on non-pharmacological approaches to the management of chronic non-cancer pain. The first three, and this one shortly after we're completed, are available on CADIS YouTube channel. A link to the session with the evidence summary and an evaluation will be emailed out at the end of the presentation. We uh, take the evaluations very seriously. We have incorporated feedback from our previous three sessions into this one. So please do take the time to complete the evaluation. An evaluation will pop up at the end of the presentation. Uh, so you could do it right then, or again, it will be emailed out after the fact. During the session, please submit your questions via the Q&A tab at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We will uh, have time for questions after the first three presenters. Um, we will not be answering any specific patient-related questions, more on the topic um, as a, a general basis. Next slide, please. In 2018, Cadiff published an environmental scan on the access, availability, and effectiveness of non-pharmacological interventions for chronic non-cancer pain. I'm sure we can all agree that Pain is a very complicated uh, issue and uh, different approaches work differently for different people and different kinds of pain. So we are exploring different aspects and today we'll be looking at physical activity. We have three wonderful speakers on the topic and like I said, we'll have time for questions of each three at the end of the presentation. Dr. Britt Cooper-Jones has worked as a knowledge mobilization officer at Cadiff since October 2018. She previously worked in healthcare research and continuing medical education. She holds an MD degree from the University of British Columbia. Dr. Susan Tupper is the strategy consultant for pain quality improvement for the Saskatchewan Health Authority. She is a licensed physical therapist with a PhD in community health and epidemiology and a postdoctoral fellowship in pediatrics. Susan's role with the Health Authority includes applied research, program planning, clinical standard writing, and education for healthcare providers, trainees, and the public. Her research examines clinical interactions about pain for those with chronic health conditions, virtual reality for pain management in people with dementia, and education about pain. Susan is co-chair of the Saskatchewan Pain Society Incorporated, a nonprofit charity that aims to improve pain management in Saskatchewan. Nikki Cook is 23 years old and is currently an education student at the University of Regina studying health and inclusion education. She has been living with chronic pain for the last nine years with two diagnoses of psoriatic arthritis and complex regional pain syndrome with dystonia. When she is not in class, Nikki is either at work as a direct care aide for adults with special needs with her beagle Sadie or spending time with family and friends all while never letting chronic pain define who she is or get in her way. With that, I invite Britt to begin. All right, thank you very much, Sean. Um, Jose, you can move the slides uh, ahead. Um, you can actually go ahead again. So we just have our standard disclosure slide in the interest of time, I will skip over that. No conflicts of interest uh, to declare and move ahead one more, please. Um, you can move the slide one more ahead. Thank you, that's perfect. So to start off with, for those who may be new to the webinar series or not familiar with Cadith, uh, if you can go back to the, um, sorry, the slide about Cadith, that was the one I'm on right now, just describing what Cadith is. So we are an independent not-for-profit organization uh, responsible for providing Canada's healthcare decision makers with objective evidence about the optimal use of drugs and medical devices. 
Um, so part of the services that uh, we provide at CADETH are rapid evidence reviews on questions asked by our customers. These can range from simple reference lists of relevant literature all the way to more complex evidence reviews that may include critical appraisal, um, which are the types of reports we'll be going over today. So today I have two of CADETH's reports uh, on the topic of physical activity as a non-pharmacological management strategy for chronic pain. So I'm going to use my uh, 12 minutes today to go over those two reports. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so getting right into it, uh, we'll start with the broader of the two reports. Uh, so chronic pain is defined as pain lasting longer uh, than three months. And as you all know, it can lead to reduced quality of life, decreased mental health, increased healthcare utilization, and a reduced ability to fully participate in one's own life. Um, it's estimated that one in five Canadians uh, experience chronic pain. And there's a variety of pharmacological and non-pharmacological uh, strategies that can be used to manage pain. One is physical activity, which is what we're looking at uh, today. But uh, this slide here on the left-hand side, um, Kadath actually identified a Cochrane overview of systematic reviews that looks at the question of what is the effectiveness of physical activity for chronic pain is a very broad question. And so rather than duplicating uh, the effort, Kadath actually chose to summarize and appraise uh, this review that was already done by, by Cochrane on the topic. So that's the first report that I'll be covering uh, today. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, this Cochrane review was published in 2017. The reference is there on the slide in case anyone wants to look at it uh, after the fact or reference it. Um, and essentially, it's an overview of all Cochrane systematic reviews um, on any exercise intervention for any type of chronic pain. So very large report. Um, moving forward to the next slide, please, in terms of the uh, literature that was identified. So in this, uh, in the search performed by Cochrane, they identified 475 publications and ultimately 21 uh, Cochrane systematic reviews met the inclusion criteria and were synthesized uh, in this report. Um, it is important to note the diversity of these different systematic reviews. They covered 10 different chronic pain conditions and a whole myriad of different exercise interventions. Um, so it's quite broad, which is both a strength and a weakness. We can talk more about that later. Uh, the primary outcome of interest across the board for all of the reviews was self-reported pain severity. Um, secondary outcomes included things like physical function, psychological function, quality of life, adherence to the prescribed exercise intervention, healthcare use or attendance, and then of course, adverse events and death. Um, it's worth noting that the quality of the systematic reviews themselves was found to be high uh, when they were critically appraised, um, but the quality of the individual studies within the reviews um, was low. Uh, and there were actually, I should also mention, there were 264 randomized control trials across the systematic reviews. So quite a lot of evidence, but overall those primary studies were of lower quality. Um, next slide, please. Um, so just briefly, the strengths and limitations, and then we'll jump right into the findings. But the strengths were that the systematic reviews were well conducted. There was that large volume of literature. Um, and then of note for any clinicians or uh, people practicing who may be listening today, uh, if you want to reference the review, it actually breaks down the findings by exercise intervention type and by chronic pain type. So say you have a patient with a, a particular pain condition, you can actually look up what might have been shown to be effective for that. So I believe that's presented as a table in the report and um, it does aim to make it more useful for real world practice. But then again, those limitations, only Cochrane systematic reviews were included. So anything else uh, would have been missed. Um, there's of course that heterogeneity of evidence and then finally, the fact that if there were recent primary studies, those may also have been missed simply because of the time backlog with systematic reviews. So while the systematic review was published, say it was 2014 or 2015 or 2016 even, and then this was compiled in 2017, if any primary studies were done since then, those wouldn't have been included. Um, but of course, most importantly are the key messages. So let's get to that on our next slide. Um, so overall, there is low quality evidence to suggest that physical activity may indeed reduce pain severity and improve physical function uh, when compared to no intervention for adults with chronic pain. Um, there were a small number of minor adverse events, uh, but it was noted that this was primarily muscle soreness uh, and that it subsided uh, in most cases fairly quickly. Um, 
however, of course, given that the primary studies were of lower quality, um, you know, in the future, high quality research may help to provide some better answers. Uh, but to the next slide, our bottom line here is really that uh, there is evidence uh, and quite a lot of studies that actually do suggest physical activity does have a benefit uh, for uh, improving uh, pain and function for adults with chronic pain with few adverse events. Uh, so that's a summary of that first Cochrane review, which uh, was quite broad. Um, you can move ahead to the next slide now, please. Um, so the second Cadith report is actually much more specific, and this is because Cadith produces these reports in response to specific customer inquiries. So we were asked about physical activity for chronic osteoarthritic knee pain specifically. Um, and we've included that in the webinar here today because it also falls into that umbrella of exercise interventions for chronic pain. Um, moving ahead to the next slide, please. Uh, so osteoarthritis is caused by wearing down of cartilage in the joints. It may affect multiple joints, but it occurs most frequently at the knee. And you know, as with other chronic pain conditions, there's both the pharmacological and non-pharmacological approaches that can be taken. Uh, but this report is going to specifically look at physical activity interventions. Um, onto the next slide, please. So here we have uh, the research question. Um, you know, what's the clinical effectiveness of physical activity specifically for knee osteoarthritis? And this is actually an update, a 2019 update to a 2017 CADETH report on this topic. So just looking to see if there was any new evidence that may have changed the findings since then. Um, moving ahead, in terms of the literature that was identified, uh, so CADETH's information specialists, uh, their search brought in a total of 597 citations. Um, and after screening these three publications ultimately met our inclusion criteria. Uh, so two of these were regular systematic reviews and one was an umbrella systematic review, which like our Cochrane review is a, a systematic review of systematic reviews. Um, and again, there was actually a lot of literature in the sense that these three reviews uh, included a total of 311 randomized controlled trials. Uh, outcomes of interest included pain reduction, functional performance, quality of life, disability level, safety, and global impression of recovery. Um, and again, overall, the quality of the systematic reviews themselves was good, um, but the quality of the primary studies contained within those reviews uh, was lower. Um, next slide, please. So uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to go straight ahead to the key messages and the findings here. This is a bit of a busy slide, but everyone will be provided with a summary document um, accompanying this presentation, which has all our key messages if, uh, if you'd like to reference them moving forward. Um, but uh, in summary, what the, uh, the evidence found is that there is evidence to suggest that physical activity may reduce pain and improve function, performance, and health-related quality of life when compared with usual care, no treatment, or sham interventions. So the literature did find a benefit uh, with physical activity. Um, the limited evidence on adverse events suggested a temporary increase in minor pain with exercise, but there was no difference in longer-term worsening pain falls or death um, and no serious adverse events and it did not affect the frequency of knee replacement surgeries between those who received exercise interventions and those who did not. Um, as with the Cochrane review, uh, because of the uh, low quality of the primary studies, you know, the variety of interventions, the, the differing lengths of follow-up, the differing frequency and duration of exercise, etc. Uh, ultimately, this field could benefit from more high quality research as well. Um, but going to my next slide for our bottom line, uh, our bottom line is that the evidence, while it is of low quality, does suggest that physical activity can help to improve chronic osteoarthritic knee pain uh, with minimal adverse events. So um, those are the two reports Cadeth has done on, uh, on physical activity interventions for chronic pain, looking at chronic pain broadly and then chron uh, specifically looking at knee osteoarthritis. So as, as Sean mentioned, we'll be taking questions at the end, uh, but before we get to that, we'll pass it along to our next speaker. Thank you, Britt. The question and answer tab is at the bottom of your Zoom screen as a reminder. Feel free to type those in there and our presenters may answer them uh, via text or like I say, we'll have some time at the end. With that, Susan, can I, you go ahead, please? Great, thank you. And I am sitting in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan right now. So welcome everybody. 
Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, physical activity and exercise for people living with chronic pain based on a clinician perspective. And I have attempted to um, provide advice from uh, kind of a multidisciplinary perspective. So um, I'm a physical therapist, but hopefully uh, the information that I share can be applied by any on any discipline. Next slide, please. So uh, for my disclosures, I hold a number of research grants at the moment. None are applicable to this presentation at the moment. Next slide. I volunteer for uh, SAS Pain on the board of directors and my primary affiliation is with the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Next slide. So I'm going to start off uh, talking about our conceptualization of pain and exercise and also the different pain experiences that people living with chronic pain have to navigate when they begin to be physically active and, and maintaining activity as well. And uh, I'll talk as well about some of the other uh, considerations that affect whether someone begins or maintains an exercise program that, uh, and, and factors that we need to really think about when we're prescribing or recommending exercise. And finally, I'll, I'll end with a framework that can be used clinically to help people living with pain to proactively plan around uh, pain self-management when they're going to be active. Next slide. So to start off with just, uh, you know, thinking about how exercise and how pain are conceptualized. And uh, we've all seen media reports and we've all seen slogans from the fitness industry uh, that really um, frame exercise as if good exercise means that you're pushing yourself to your ultimate limits. Uh, so we, you know, we idolize the athletes that play when they're injured and we, um, you know, we hear things like, you know, go heavy or go home that really, you know, maybe conceptualize exercise as being, you know, if you're not pushing yourself to your ultimate limits, really why bother? Or of course, the, the famous no pain, no gain uh, that we've been fighting with for the past 40 years. Uh, so these types of conceptualizations around exercise being this, you know, pushing yourself really hard uh, can affect people living with chronic pain in, in that it can create a sense of guilt or a sense of shame around their exercise participation. So this, you know, pushing yourself to your ultimate limits is, is not good advice for people living with pain. And if they're comparing themselves to their former self before they had their pain condition, or comparing themselves to their peers who may be functioning at a higher level. Um, I've heard lots of patients as well as uh, research participants say that they, they feel that they never feel like they're doing enough. And so it's important as we're recommending physical activity participation that we explore that sense of guilt or that, that definition of what a successful exercise session means to people living with pain. Uh, for some people, the, uh, the, even the word exercise can conjure up these images of, of sweating and exhaustion and, and, you know, not very pleasant images. And so, uh, especially when people are starting out, uh, it may be better to encourage being more physically active or encourage movement rather than using the word exercise. And of course, for people living with pain, the, the start low, go slow um, is really the best slogan that, that we can encourage. And so for some people living with chronic pain, we may be starting them by interrupting sedentary time. Um, so I'm not going to be recommending any you know, specific numbers of reps or numbers of minutes of, of exercise in this presentation, because it really depends on the individual. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how you navigate that with, with people who are beginning to exercise. Next slide. At the other end of the spectrum, um, you know, uh, many people living with chronic pain can develop, develop fears around uh, what pain means with exercise. And quite often this begins during the acute pain stage. And we as healthcare providers may, um, in a well-meaning way, encourage people to really use pain as a guide for, for their movement without giving them limitations on how long they should be doing that. And we may inadvertently build up a fear around what pain means when people are, are being physically active. If it hurts, don't do it or let pain be your guide. Those may be appropriate uh, sayings to use in the acute pain phase, as long as we put limits on that. Um, but it's not a helpful recommendation for people living with chronic pain who may be struggling just to get out of bed um, and, and are experiencing pain all the time. Um, so as clinicians, it's important when we are putting limitations on people during an acute pain phase, 
um, or even if they live with chronic pain and they're having a, a chronic uh, pain flare or a, an acute injury on top of their chronic pain, make sure we're giving very strict limits on our activity limitations. Um, we also need to help uh, people with pain develop a more nuanced understanding. We can't use these blanket statements of go heavier, go home, or if it hurts, don't do it. Neither of those extremes are helpful. So people living with pain need clear advice, advice on when they can keep going with pain or when they need to back off or change what they're doing um, and when they need to seek additional advice or care. Next slide, please. So I'm um, co-leading a research project with Dr. Nancy Gersick from the University of Saskatchewan. She's a professor in the College of Kinesiology and we have conducted focus groups with people living with pain as well as exercise instructors, both community-based and healthcare providers who, who encourage people with chronic pain to be active. And we've heard from them um, about four different categories of pain experiences that people living with pain have to navigate. Um, so this is that nuanced view that I was uh, talking about earlier, um, that we can't go with one extreme or the other um, as far as exercise recommendations. So the first type of pain experience, of course, is the daily chronic pain, and this is quite variable for people. For some, it varies from, from hour to hour, for other people from day to day. Um, and quite often, you know, there's, there's a bit of a sense of understanding of, of what this chronic pain experience is. It's in the same area. Um, and and uh, when people begin to exercise, um, or when they change their exercise level, the daily chronic pain tends to get a little bit worse. Um, but if they're able to stick with exercise, particularly on a daily basis, um, after about two, for some people, four weeks, um, this daily chronic pain does tend to decrease for the majority of people. And those are the results that Britt uh, um, presented on earlier from the Cochrane Review and the, the CADF reviews uh, of systematic reviews. Um, so the daily chronic pain, uh, although it's variable, it does with regular exercise tend to decrease for the majority of people. People living with chronic pain also have to navigate flares of their chronic pain. And these are the days where they really struggle to get out of bed. Um, or to, and they really have to modify or change their usual exercise program because they just cannot perform at the, the level that they have been performing. Um, so we need to uh, give some extra, build some exercise resiliency in uh, people living with chronic pain so that they know how to modify exercise during the flare of their chronic pain. Unfortunately, uh, like everyone else, people with chronic pain also experience delayed onset muscle soreness when they're performing at a, a new level or trying something new. Um, and this may be the adverse event that Britt was reporting on of, of the short-term increases in pain. It's interesting though that people living with chronic pain, for some of them, they perceive delayed onset muscle soreness as being a good pain. One of my research participants called it an exquisite pain uh, because she felt good about her exercise performance because she, she was getting soreness in these muscles that she had been working. So it feels a little bit different from the daily chronic pain, but for some people who have widespread pain, it is hard to tell the difference between delayed onset muscle soreness and just an aggravation of their daily chronic pain. Uh, for people who don't live with chronic pain, delayed onset muscle soreness tends to start about 24 hours or 48 hours after an exercise bout, and it usually lasts no more than about three days. For people living with chronic pain, it can start earlier within hours of an exercise bout and it can last five to seven days. Um, unfortunately, the only cure for delayed onset muscle soreness is more movement, uh, which of course is very different from an acute injury pain where more movement tends to just aggravate uh, the injury, like an overuse injury or, or uh, you know, a sprain or a strain from being active. And so of course we want to try to avoid acute injury pain by making sure that when people are performing exercise that they're performing it using good form um, and making sure they're not pushing themselves too much. It is difficult for people living with chronic pain to differentiate between especially the, the increase in their daily chronic pain as they're being active, the, the delayed onset muscle soreness and acute injury pain. Um, so it is best if, if people living with pain can get some tailored advice and some super, supervision with their exercise, at least for the first couple of weeks, until they get a sense of, of these different types of pain and when it's okay to keep going or when they need to back off. Next slide, please. 
Of course, pain is not the only barrier to being physically active. There are a lot of other factors to consider. Every time any one of us does an exercise bout, we go through a little mini cost benefit analysis of, of what effort it's going to require for us to be active um, and what we may get out of it. Um, so navigating these thoughts and these beliefs with people with chronic pain will help them to make decisions to begin exercise and to maintain their exercise performance. Uh, so helping them navigate through what their perceived barriers are, and that may be transportation to the, the site or finding a place where they can exercise um, or finding things that they enjoy, understanding what the equipment is or how to perform, perform the activity. Also helping them to um, better understand what their outcome expectancies are and what's realistic and what may be a misconception. So having them explore what their, even what their positive outcomes are that they expect to achieve with exercise um, which may be motivators for exercise and also the negative things that they expect to happen and help help people with pain to navigate around those and find exercises that minimize the negative outcome expectancies and those barriers and maximize the, the positive expectancies. It's also important to help people identify immediate short-term positive outcomes. So if their main outcome expectancy is that they expect to lose weight, that's too far down the road to be a, a very effective motivator for people with chronic pain. So one of the most important positive outcome expectancies is just encouraging them that being active, any amount of activity is a great success and they should be extremely proud of themselves anytime they put in the effort uh, to increase their heart rate and increase their, their blood pressure and um, be active and, and move their muscles. And so, of course, if they still have those negative perceptions about exercise and are feeling guilty and feeling that they're um, never doing enough, that is going to, to end up being a negative outcome expectancy. So you can see how having those conversations with people and reinforcing the positives of any exercise bout can be really important for uh, beginning and maintaining exercise. Next slide, please. Other things to consider are that, you know, of those systematic reviews and randomized control trials that Britt described earlier, um, no one mode of exercise is really coming out superior to others. And that has been the, the uh, what my patients and also um, the research participants that I've worked with have, have said. It's better if you do something that you enjoy. So that's the best type of exercise and ideally, uh, it's good to have a whole range of exercises that someone can perform so that if, you know, if going for a walk is your main form of exercise, but it's raining or the weather is poor, uh, you can choose a different option. So building that exercise resilience by developing a kind of a whole range of different things that you, you enjoy doing uh, that you can select from depending on the day and depending on uh, the barriers that you're encountering. Um, that is uh, one of the main ways that you can ensure that you'll remain active. Um, there was a study and it's referenced down below that was a reanalysis of the Cochrane data that of uh, the first study that Britt uh, described and in this they, they controlled for all the different types or, or components of exercise and found that frequency of exercise was the most important component. So being exercise or exercising on a daily basis um, was more likely to have a stronger impact on pain than increasing your total minutes of exercise or increasing the intensity of your exercise. Uh, so essentially that's another way of, of helping to deal with that delayed onset muscle soreness as well is just having a daily, if you can, 20 to 30 minutes a day of building up your exercise capacity um, to do something at least six days a week, uh, preferably. Um, and another uh, thing that we've heard as well, saying it was reported in the study that exercise, aerobic exercise or cardiovascular type exercises are tolerated better than resistance, especially when first starting out. And that has been confirmed in our qualitative studies with uh, our research participants. Next slide. So finally, to wrap up, I'd like to just describe um, something we've developed in our research, a, a framework that people can use to self-manage their pain using what we've called the four P's of, of pain management. Um, so looking for self-management strategies that fall into the prevention, psychological, physical, and, and pharmaceutical categories. 
So prevention being things like use of splints or braces or changing the exercise um, type of exercise that you're doing, psychological interventions like breath control, mindfulness, uh, relaxation strategies, physical strategies like self-massage, heat, ice, um, stretching or warm up, and pharmaceutical interventions of talking to your prescriber to see, or your pharmacist to see if, if there are ways of self-managing your pain. Even something as simple as timing your exercise bout to coincide with the peak effectiveness of your scheduled medications. Next slide. So how this can be used clinically is that you would create a grid for people living with pain uh, with the four categories of, of uh, strategies, self-management strategies as uh, a different row. And then each column would be um, things that they could use before, during, or after one exercise bout. So for example, this one has been filled in. So this individual, before they, um, before they begin exercising, they're doing a really slow warm up and getting the muscles nice and warmed up. They're timing the exercise with their scheduled medications. Um, during the exercise, they're distracting themselves by listening to a podcast while they walk on the treadmill. So just a note of warning that distraction is only a good thing to do if you can safely perform the exercise. You're not going to fly off the treadmill or, or hurt yourself doing it. You know, certainly don't want to distract yourself and, and harm yourself. Um, the, the individual uh, applied some exercise adaptations, so changed the load that they were using or the, the uh, speed of the repetitions that they were doing with the exercise. Uh, they used a brace on the wrist um, as a preventative measure and afterwards they cooled down and did a mindfulness meditation and used an ice pack on, on the sore part of their body. So talking through and building some self-management skills with people living with pain can help them prepare for exercise and also take some uh, ownership of the self-management role and not feel like a victim um, with their pain, with their exercise, but, but learn those skills that can help them modify and gain mastery over their pain when they exercise. Next slide. So just a summary of messages for people living with pain. Um, exercise, as uh, Britt mentioned in the, in the summary of the literature, uh, it seems to be good for people with chronic pain, and this has been reinforced with uh, hundreds of patients and uh, research participants as well, reinforcing that it is a, um, a strategy that can be quite beneficial for many people. Uh, the right exercise, of course, is any movement that you enjoy. Uh, it's important to think around and plan around uh, various barriers, including pain. And if exercise hurts, um, modify the exercise, try something different and self-manage your pain. Um, any movement is a success. You don't need to exhaust yourself in order to have a successful exercise bout. And of course, exercise has more benefits than just muscle health and, and function. It's good for, for pain, for mood, sleep, your cognitive function and, and overall disease prevention. Next slide. The summary of messages for exercise prescribers is that the pain experience with exercise is probably more complex than you may have realized. And so you need to navigate through that with the people that you're recommending um, that they be more physically active and help them identify when they should back off, when to keep going or when to seek care. Uh, very important to explore those beliefs, motivations, those outcome expectancies and help people um, think about their motivators and, and barriers to exercise. Um, help them define what a successful exercise bout is in a different way than they may have in the past and help them to uh, think about their fears with pain and movement and get more realistic understanding of what pain means with movement. And for some people that means calling it movement or calling it physical activity rather than using the the word exercise, which can be perceived quite negatively. And of course, start low and progress slowly and uh, help people to build their exercise tolerance. Next slide. I did want to highlight a, a really excellent publication uh, that's about five years old, so it's getting a little bit old, but it's still very useful. Uh, they go through exercise precautions for 26 different chronic health conditions. Um, and it, if I could summarize this article, it would be that exercise is good for all of these health conditions, but start low and go slow. Uh, so they give some uh, recommendations around that. And uh, next slide, that is the end of my presentation. And thank you very much. And my email is there if people have specific uh, 
questions for me, but we'll also be um, discussing your questions in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. That was a fantastic presentation. Go on to the next slide and welcome Nibby, Nikki to give her perspective, please. Hi there, my name is Nikki Cook. I'm 23 years old and I am from Regina, Saskatchewan. I'm currently an education student with a major in health education and a minor in inclusive education. Um, along with being a full-time student, I also work as a direct care aide at a group home here in Regina for three women with special needs. In my spare time when I'm not studying or working, which is not often, um, I enjoy spending time out at the lake with my family, hanging out with my friends, my boyfriend, my beagle Sadie, watching movies and attending every concert, every country music concert I can, pre-COVID that is. Um, and all of these things are what I believe define me as a person. These are the things that people see when they look at me. But what you would never know just from looking at me is something that defines what I am able to do and what I am not able to do every day. I'm 23 years old and I have lived with chronic pain for the last two, for the last nine years of my life. I have two diagnoses, one of psoriatic arthritis that affects almost all of my joints in my body and one of complex regional pain syndrome or CRPS with a dystonia that was in my left leg. Now, while that may seem like it defines me, I refuse to let it. When I was 14 years old, my life revolved around friends and basketball until I found out I had psoriatic arthritis. Almost all of my joints were affected. I went from having basketball games, practices, and workouts almost seven days a week to needing help getting out of bed, cutting up my food, and washing my own hair. It took a couple of years to figure out my new diagnosis, figure out when to push myself and when to relax and figure out my medications before my joints finally began to settle back down. Along with trying to figure out my new life with arthritis, I had to figure out how to not be afraid of physical activity. Healthcare providers encouraged me to get back to physical activity, but no one really explained to me how to do that. Being an elite athlete, I struggled. I didn't know how to go slow. I didn't know how to pace myself. I started back at the gym, overdid it, and caused flares. I was scared, so I stayed away from physical activity, which made my swelling and my stiffness much worse, which caused my sleep pattern to get out of hand, and school became even more of a struggle. While I was trying to figure out what was best for my body with arthritis, I developed complex regional pain syndrome when I was 17 years old. CRPS is a nerve condition that causes severe complex pain. CRPS affected my left leg. I had a dystonia and was unable to walk or to even tell my brain to wiggle my toes for almost nine months. I was 17, a senior in high school, dealing with a pre-existing cr chronic pain diagnosis and now complex pain, and I had to relearn how to walk. Now physical activity meant something completely different to me. It was standing between the parallel, bar, the parallel bars at Wascana Rehab, hoping I could make it 10 steps in a row. Slowly, it got better. I was able to walk with my crutches. I was able to walk with one crutch, no crutches, and it took a long time, but eventually I was back in the gym. Physical activity is now how I regulate my, st my stiffness in my back, knees, and hips. When I'm not stiff, I can move around more, which decreases my swelling and therefore decreases my pain. Physical activity is the reason I can play with my dog. It is the reason I will be able to run around with my own kids when the time comes. And most of all, it's the reason I'm able to walk today. I take each day as it comes and don't push myself. Sometimes my physical activity is a walk, sometimes it's a run, weights, and sometimes it's even multiple spin classes in a day, which I never imagined I would be able to do. But I find that the more consistent I am, the easier it is and the less pain I have on a day-to-day -day basis. 
having chronic pain at such a young age, I thought physical activity would be a very rare occurrence for me. And as an athlete, I struggled with that. But little did I know, staying active is what helps me attain a normal life for a 23 year old with or without chronic pain. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. It's always fantastic to have that, that lived experience and I appreciate you sharing that with us. Jose, I'm wondering if you can go back to slide number 19. I just wanted to leave that on the screen for a little bit because uh, we're happy that we have um, this resource. Um, there, there's a series of patient and clinician resources on the topic of non-pharmacological -pharma treatment options for chronic pain that are available at the cadeth.ca website slash chronic pain, which on slide 19, we'll get it there. You can see it and copy that down. While we're looking at that, a couple of the questions, um, and I think there's a theme that I'll direct towards Susan and maybe Nikki, you could add your perspective on the physical activity, whether it's physiological activity or if it's the endorphins and the mental health um, benefits that come out of physical activity. Susan, can you comment on that? Yeah, I can. I, I didn't have time to go into some of the neurophysiological effects of exercise, but there's a, a really fantastic body of literature on the proposed mechanisms of how being physically active may help with pain. And so um, the, there's a number of proposed mechanisms. I don't, I, it's multi-dimensional for sure. I don't think we have it all nailed down yet. Um, but it, it's, interesting, it's interesting that when people are physically active, even at very low levels, um, so for example, walking on a treadmill at about a 70% of your VO2 max or, or like a moderate level of exercise, enough to increase your heart rate and blood pressure, but not enough to exhaust you, even just five minutes of that will produce a widespread, um, what's called an exercise-induced hypoalgesia response. What that means is that it, your body is basically protected um, or, or changes your pain thresholds through your body. So it's centrally mediated. Um, it's happening in the brain and the nervous system. Um, the reasons why that happens, um, the number one um, thinking around this is that it's an endogenous uh, opioids. So your endorphins and keflins, dynorphins um, that your brain is producing that help to reduce your pain sensitivity. Um, the other uh, thing that has recently, or over the last five years, has come out in the research is that there's a production of endogenous uh, cannabinoids, so endocannabinoids, that also influence your pain. We know, too, that there's um, an anti-inflammatory response that uh, doesn't happen immediately with exercise, so it's not part of that endogenous uh, inhibition of, of pain with exercise, um, but it, it can have a long-term effect on reducing your inflammation. So for the short term, you get this increase in inflammation uh, for a few hours, followed by about two days of an anti-inflammatory response. And there's a number of other neurochemicals that are produced with exercise, even small bouts of exercise uh, that influence things like brain-derived neurotrophic factors and, um, and, and uh, other um, uh, neurochemicals that will help to regenerate nerves and, and help to um, you know, change pain sensitivity throughout the body. So, so whether it's the actual movement of the muscles, that for sure is a component of it. Um, but there's also, for, absolutely, there's a, a being in, engaged with the world and changing your mood. And, you know, it's, it's definitely complex. I don't think we can tease those pieces apart. Um, but, it, you know, there are those widespread influences of being physically active. So, just being engaged with other people or, or doing something that you enjoy, being out in outside and being in the green space, may be um, changing your perceptions, which then increase your endorphins, which then affect your pain. Um, but we know that it is a component of, um, you know, there's, there's the muscle functions that will have an effect, but also the engagement in doing something you enjoy that, that is effective as well. And that may explain why doing housework is not as enjoyable and doesn't have the same pain effects as uh, being physically active and doing something you enjoy. So it may require the muscle activity, but it's certainly not enjoyable for me anyway, and uh, doesn't have the same pain relieving effects for people. Thank you, Susan. 
Nikki, you talked about uh, the, the low point of being unable to walk as a, as a teenager and then the elation that came with, you know, crutches to one crutch to cane to being without. Can you, can you comment on that, that mental health aspect of, of exercise? Yeah, I think for me, um, I mean, obviously it was amazing to be able to walk again. Um, I remember my mom has a picture of it on her camera the first time I was able to put a shoe, like a normal shoe on because I had a dystonia and my foot was stuck to the side. And the smile on my face, I don't know if I have ever felt that since. Um, but when I work out now, it's a way for me to get my frustration out. It's a way for me to turn my brain off. It's a way for me to not think about anything. And that includes my feet or my hands or my back hurting. Um, and I think it's just a great way for me to use that outlet. And then it also really helps me sleep, which I find um, when I'm tired, my pain is escalated a lot. That's, that's fantastic. And a nice segue to another question that we had for you, Nikki, was how do you, how do you deal with flare, flare ups, you know, physical or mentally? How do you get, get past that? Um, it's taken a lot to figure out how to deal with my flares. Um, luckily for me, for my arthritis, I have an amazing specialist. Um, and her and I have kind of built the relationship over the last nine years. And she really trusts um, what I know as a patient. Um, so she knows that when I call her office and I say, it's really bad, I need, I need this, or I think I need this. Um, she'll bring me in and we'll have a discussion over that. And she really values my opinion, which I don't think I would be able to see a specialist who didn't take my opinion into consideration when doing treatment. Um, mentally, I rely a lot on my support systems. I have an amazing family. I would not have been able to get through both of my diagnoses without them. Um, I have amazing friends who understand what I'm going through. And I think it's okay to be frustrated and my family can attest that I will cry and get frustrated and ask why me um, but also at the end of the day I know that I don't want to ask why me for the rest of my life when I'm only 23 years old um, but it's okay to have those things and to persevere and flares end and in them they feel like they're not going to end um, but they do as long as you have that support system and those outlets to help you through those. Thank you, Nikki. Um, there were many comments written about, thank you very much for sharing. So I just wanted to re reiterate that. Uh, Susan, a couple questions for you. Um, one is about timelines. Uh, what should the limit for acute pain restrictions be? I'm sure that's individual, but do you have some, some sort of ballpark? And the other one is about um, navigating exercise with patients that are worried about a missed injury. So they're struggling with, with the benefits of exercise because they're worried that maybe one, an injury isn't being assessed or diagnosed. Can you comment on those? Yeah, good questions. Um, as far as the timeline for restrictions during the acute phase, I, I would not be willing to put a number out there because it really does depend on, on what, what has happened. So, um, you know, if there's a minor surgical incision versus, you know, some tremendous uh, traumatizing fractures and all sorts of you know complex injuries it's, it's going to influence so um you know basically if the guidelines can follow the stages of tissue healing as best as the clinicians can come up with as, as far as what they understand the tissues to be that are affected um, but we know that even with injuries um, the the quicker people can become activated the better my line of thinking um, around this, and it ties in with the other question as well, is that you know we should be trying to find ways for people to remain active, even if they're not using the body part that was injured. It's a little bit different, of course, if you've got a widespread injury that you know you have multiple um, parts of the body that are affected and and you know maybe immobilized. Um, but you know we can if you're if you're you've got rheumatoid arthritis that's causing a flare of your left knee or some other injury like that uh, or, or an injury that's affecting one part of the body, you can be exercising the other parts of the body and, and engaging those centrally mediated influences on pain. Um, so as much as possible, 
we need to help support people to remain active and find ways of modifying activities so that even during an acute injury, um, they can keep moving. And then as time goes on, as the tissues heal and they're ready to be activated and mobilized, um, that people can transform their exercise and, and start engaging the part of the body that may have gone through the acute injury. I hope that addressed both of those questions. Uh, yeah. Sorry, the, the question about missing an injury, uh, again, keeping people active while they're waiting for diagnostic findings is, I think, a really important thing as well. So, um, you know, I, I may be a little bit biased in this, but I, I would like everybody to see a physical therapist or occupational therapist or exercise therapist to, to get advice on how to uh, remain active regardless of uh, what injury they may have faced. Thanks, Susan. Uh, Britt, a couple questions have come in about um, the quality of the evidence. And I don't know if, if you, when you were reviewing it, you noticed um, with low quality evidence, uh, I mean, there's limitations, but were, were there any studies that incorporated real world evidence or patient perspectives? And then while we're on the topic of evidence, did you notice how they could double blind studies when it comes to physical exercise? Uh, good questions as well, trying to keep them both in my head at the same time. And in terms of your first one, um, so for the first report, the systematic reviews had 264 individual randomized controlled trials contained within them, and the second one had 311 RCTs contained within them. So I didn't look at the level of the individual studies, because that would have been um, a lot of individual studies over 500, so I can't comment on whether individual studies mentioned real world evidence or patient perspectives, but I can comment more broadly on why the quality of the evidence was deemed to be low, um, which kind of uh, brings it to your, your um, second question about double blinding. I don't think it was about whether or not the, there was blinding when they assessed the quality of low, it was because the, the samples in the studies were so small. So rather than having hundreds of patients that were being looked at, it was only a handful of patients. In many cases, the actual exercise interventions were either poorly described or not consistent, which might actually make sense from a practical viewpoint from what Susan had said, you know, maybe there needs to be that variability in terms of what works for someone, you know, what they're doing, how often they're doing it. So I think because the variability in what people were doing was so great, or because the way it was reported was just not detailed enough. It was, it, it was hard for the reader to be able to say, you know, okay, if you have knee osteoarthritis, to give that one example, or if you have, you know, this other pain condition, you know, go on the elliptical for 20 minutes, three times a week, there was no answers like that. It was much more um, either undefined or variable. So that was my understanding of why it was low and not necessarily even getting into the blinding because I don't know uh, you know, I, I, I don't know how realistic it would be to create exercise interventions, I mean, of that nature, but uh, did that answer the, the questions? Was there a part I I've missed? So. I think that was the, the nature of the, the question is, how do you double blind? Because um, that would be very difficult. Um, would that mean that there's low quality evidence? Um, is it still applicable to that setting where the studies were done well um, but they were considered low because it wasn't double blinded. I guess it's, it gets kind of complex, but I think you've, you've addressed it. Yeah, and I think it's, it wasn't low because it wasn't double blinded necessarily. The reasons they gave were the small sample sizes and the inconsistency in what the exercise was and, and what each person did. I think those were the main reasons. Fantastic. Susan, can you comment on the use of warm or, or ice compresses in conjunction with physical act, um, activity and, and is there principles that guide the, the, their use? Uh, for chronic pain, it really it is up to the individual and what they prefer. So some people prefer heat, others prefer ice. Um, most people when they're warming their body with exercise do prefer to cool themselves down. Um, others don't. So it really is an individual, um, an individual preference for heat and cold. Um, what does matter though is how long people keep them on. So 
um, general guidelines for this is no more than about 15 to 20 minutes and then checking the surface of the skin um, after a few minutes or no more than five minutes you want to check and make sure that it's not too hot or too cold um, but just something that basically changes the uh, um, the input from the skin can help to change the, the perception of pain so Fantastic. Uh, Susan, still on you. Um, when it comes to physical activity, do you have experience and do you, can you give benefits or, or cons to group activity versus individual activity? Again, that's a personal preference. Um, for some people, as they're, especially when they're starting, they prefer to be individualized and supervised. Um, other people prefer a group setting, so it really depends on the personality and the preference of the, the person. It's nice. If they can have options uh, to engage in both, um, you know, especially when somebody's relearning an activity that they may have been able to do comfortably before, um, they like to do it in, in a certain amount of privacy. That came out in our, our research findings as well that people were embarrassed to go to uh, gyms because they, you know, they either forgot how to do things that they feel like they should know about. Um, again. Um, you know, there's, we have to really work with people to address those issues around embarrassment and shame with exercise and reinforce the, the positives. But those are, those are difficult archetypal kind of uh, beliefs that people have and they're, they're hard to, um, they're hard to break just with a casual conversation. And so um, helping someone to develop, develop that competency and, and confidence and in what they're doing first in a private setting and then moving into a group setting may, may be the right way to go for some people. And then other people just don't care and they're happy to go and hang out with a group of people, either a mixed group that have some people living with pain and some that don't. Um, and that was another finding from our research that people really wanted opportunities, a range of opportunities. They wanted to be able to um, work out on their own or exercise on their own. Um, they wanted to be able to work in a group of, you know, with their family and friends who may not be living with pain. And they also wanted op options for exercising with other people with chronic pain to learn from, from others and to share kind of a sort of support group type setting with others uh, living with chronic pain. Thank you, Susan. We are almost out of time. So, um, Britt, do you have any final messages on the evidence? Um, no, I would just summarize it that, you know, it does support the effectiveness of physical activity, even if those studies were called low, there's over 500 of them and the message is overall supportive. Thank you. And, and Susan, uh, any uh, like one or two things uh, uh, that should be a takeaway for people? Uh, no, I just wanted to highlight that, you know, we have the, the Canadian guidelines on physical activity participation that recommend that adults uh, between 18 and uh, up should be performing about 150 minutes of moderate or vigorous physical activity per week and two days a week of resistance exercise. Um, please, whatever you do as clinicians, do not start off by telling people to follow Canada's uh, guidelines on physical activity participation. Um, if they do know about that, say that that's our long-term goal, we're going to eventually get there, um, but you can get benefits from being physically active at much lower levels than that. Um, however, that is uh, where it would be great if people could get to because then they have overall health benefits. Uh, but again, just starting low, going slow, um, and um, you know, helping people develop that resiliency so that they have different options and they can stay active on a daily basis. Uh, regardless of what their pain is doing to them on that particular day. Thank you, Susan. And, and Nikki, from, from your perspective as somebody living with this, what, what is one or two things that you wish all practitioners would know or understand when it comes to physical activity for pain? Um, I think the main thing is just listening to the patient and understanding that it's different for everyone and understanding that um, the frustration that comes along with it, especially if they come from a background where they were able to be more physically active before, uh, which is most cases. Um, but yeah, really listening and taking and showing that you understand where they're coming from. That's very sage advice. Thank you, Nikki. As everybody can see on the screen, that's how to connect with Cadith as well as to find the recordings of our other sessions and this one shortly. 
um, an evaluation will come up on your screen. Please do take the time to, uh, to give us some feedback. Thank you everybody for participating. Um, the slide, there was a question about the slides. The slides won't be uh, shared per se, but the recordings are, and of course everything is there, as well as an evidence summary. And uh, please uh, stay tuned for more webinars on this topic and others coming from Cadeth. Thank you.